All right, hi everybody, and today we're just uh, continuing on in the series called Rest and War. Um, and uh, again, just as a reminder, uh, when we say war, um, we are talking about spiritual warfare or spiritual battles, or sometimes the Bible uses word a word called adversity. Uh, that that that's what we mean, and that. Uh, in our lives as followers of Jesus, we are going to move in and out of these times of rest uh, as Jesus was called away and, and removed himself at different times uh, into the mountains and into the hills for prayer to be with his father, but then would, of course, be right there engaging uh, a dark world and the demonic world uh, and ministry. So uh, this idea for us that God will take us through times of rest and also times of spiritual battles and uh, uh, adversity and and maybe it's not always uh, that kind of clear cut you know oh this is a rest day and this is a spiritual battle day wouldn't it be nice if it all showed up like that you could just put it on your calendar uh, this is spiritual battle day uh, I'm sorry uh, I'm sorry uh, Satan but this is Monday and this is my rest day so please no spiritual battles on Monday and uh, it'd be nice but it's not quite that neat but I think you get where I'm coming from and what we're talking about when we're talking about times of rest and times of adversity. And and in this part of the talk today, and again, we're following a series by Ben Stewart, um, we've called ourselves uh, Rest and War, which is the, called the sermon series Rest and War, this teaching series that, but it goes along with a a video-based curriculum that is available uh, that you can find on Amazon or just about any, you know, just, just uh, Baidu, Google it, whatever search engine, engine you use, you'll find it. The author's name is Ben, ben Stewart, and he's also written a book by the same title. This teaching series uh, kind of complements uh, that book and that small group curriculum. And, and you know, in this particular, I think it's session three for uh, the Rest and War series with Ben Stewart, he's talking about temptation. And he particularly is teaching from James chapter one, and just on kind of like what tempt, kind of a, a, a dissection of, of temptation and what it, what it looks like. And we're going to also be talking about temptation today too, but we're going to come at it from the from, from this approach. We're going to break down the 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 temptation that one particular person in the Bible has. We're going to look at it like a like a case study. We're going to look at a case study of temptation in the life of one particular person in the Bible, and uh, his name is Peter, um, and from the New Testament, one of the original twelve disciples. And in this case study. And by the way, I, I think Peter's story of temptation um, is there for us to learn from. It's, it's, it's there in the Bible as a case study. I mean, it was a real person and it really happened, but it's there. And my point is, is that, that we can learn from it and also that we can be prepared because as followers of Jesus, we will also be tempted as, as Peter and many others were tempted. You know, you, you've probably heard something like this before that, we often learn more from each other, and we learn so much from other people. We learn a lot from books. We all learn a lot from the library, going to school. Um, but uh, that's one way to learn. But we also learn a lot from other people and their experiences. And, and it's often been said that, that we learn more from other people's failures uh, than we do their successes. I mean, how many times in a conference, a workshop, a retreat setting you've gone to, uh, it's the person that's talking to you not about, I was successful here, then I was successful over there, and everything worked out for me over here. You know, it's the person that is relating uh, the struggles, the failures, the, the you know, ambiguity of leadership or, or just the experiences that, that we can have. Um, and again, we're talking here about Peter who, there's a lot that we can say about him, uh, but for today, we're going to focus on uh, a little bit of background of Peter, which, which is to say the part of his background that, that, that's influencing the significant temptation that Peter is going to experience um, on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And I'll just go ahead and tell you right now that this was a temptation that Peter failed in. So this isn't a success story. This isn't a story of Peter facing temptation, but rising above it and getting through it unharmed and perfectly. 
This is actually the story of a person who faced temptation and then failed in that temptation. And maybe the only way that we can even begin to understand temptation is to uh, is to know how it and and know how it works and know what it is is to be able to finish the sentence um, uh, tempted to do what you know temptations I'm going to assume that probably many of you listening probably already know especially in a biblical context what temptation is about or what temptation is or you can uh, you know create a biblical scenario uh, and and a tempting situation but not assuming everything or anything, I'm going to ask the question, you know, to understand temptation and what it is. What are we being tempted to do? Temptation to do what? You know, for example, uh, no one has ever been, I don't think, been tempted to eat a whole bowl of broccoli, right? You never hear of anybody saying, yeah, I was in a real temptation situation last night. It was late at night. I came home from work. I was tired. I felt weak. I felt vulnerable. And I opened up the refrigerator. And what did I see? I saw a big bowl of broccoli. And I just ate all of it right there. I just totally gave in to temptation. And I ate that whole bowl of broccoli. So you never, never hear anybody, anybody being tempted to eat a bowl of broccoli. Now, tempted to eat a half gallon of ice cream in one sitting? Sure. Sure, we can. We, uh, I know lots of stories. Like that. I know that temptation. I think I'm just going to eat this whole thing right now, this whole bit of ice cream. So tempted to do what? The implied rest of the sentence is like this. Tempted to sin. All right? We are tempted to sin. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we have, we are, or we will be tempted to sin uh, because we have an enemy of our souls that is constantly bringing temptations to us, to temptations to do what? Temptations to sin, which begs the question, what is sin? And I thought this might be helpful right here is you just take a moment and take a look at what the Bible says is sin. I'm mean, looking at this more closely. All right, so there are several words that get used at, uh, for the for the Hebrew and Greek words for sin. You, you probably know, you may know that the Bible was written originally in Hebrew, the Hebrew language and the Greek language, um, and some Aramaic, uh, but mostly the overwhelming majority of it is in Hebrew and in uh, Greek. And now, when that gets translated into it gets been translated into multiple languages of the world, many, many of them. But when it gets translated into English, that the Hebrew and Greek words for sin get translated into the English words iniquity or transgression, and of course, of course, the word sin. So the the word iniquity in its original meaning meant and described a behavior that was crooked. All right. So um, an iniquity was something that was not straight or was crooked. Or a transgression described the breaking of a trust. So when a trust was broken, this was called a transgression. When a contract was broken, this was called a transgression. And the word sin, both in Hebrew and in Greek, uh, describes the failing to reach the goal or the missing of the target, or the missing of the mark, right? And actually, actually, the word sin in Hebrew and Greek is not even a religious word. It's funny to think now, at least, in, I'm not, and, and, and I'm a native English speaker, and this is coming to you in English, but uh, that at least all these centuries later, uh, millennia later, um, we think of the word sin, and we, we probably, many of us, put that in a religious context. But actually, in Hebrew and in Greek, uh, in the first century, uh, anyway, in the New Testament, uh, it's not a religious word. If you shoot an arrow and you're shooting at a target, you want to knock an apple off of the tree. You, wanna, you want that arrow to fly and hit that apple, and you miss it. Uh, you've sinned. That's, you've, you've missed the mark. You've missed the goal. Uh, uh, of course, this makes us want to ask yet another question. What's the target? <laughs> What's the goal? If, if sin is missing the goal, then what is the goal? What's our target? And, and that gets a little more complicated. Uh, and, and so we'll just kind of unpack a little bit. And there's so much more, of course, that we could have said here. But think of it this way. Every human, every human person, according to uh, the teaching of the Bible, 
was made in the image of God. Every human is the image of God. So we bear his image and his likeness. So when we fail to honor the likeness that shapes who we are, our very essence and a very definition of what it means to be human is shaped and defined by the image that we are made in, which is God. And when this image bearer fails to honor um, the God whose image we bear, uh, then we are missing the goal because that's the goal. That's the target to bear rightly, appropriately, truly, sincerely, authentically, purely uh, the image of God himself. And then when we fail to do this, honor each other, other image bearers of God, we are also missing the goal, missing the target um, or, or sinning. All right. So, so uh, the famous Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter twenty are a description of the some of the ways that this can happen. So you've you got all those ten of those commandments, right? So when we make other things and just about anything uh, can be done uh, this way, we make anything the thing that receives our worship. We are failing to honor the God whose image we bear. We are failing to honor Him, and we are sinning. Or, or when we steal, we take things from other people. Right? These Ten Commandments are, are there for us to see how we can uh, hit the target and hit the mark. And so when we take things from each other that don't belong to us and we steal from each other, this is missing the mark. Here's an example from the Bible. In Genesis, when Joseph, who is a, uh, the head of the slaves and head of the house, he is a slave in Potiphar's house. All right, You can read his story there in the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible. Uh, when Potiphar's wife wants to have sex with Joseph... And, and he refuses her, um, he gives as the reason, how can I sin against God? All right, here's Potiphar's wife. She is coming on to Joseph. She wants to have sex with him. And, and he refuses her, not because, you know, your husband will be real, your husband will find out and we'll all be in a lot of trouble here. You know, no, he says, this will not, my having sex with you, my, my master's wife will not honor God. It's not the way we honor to God. And I'll miss the mark. I'll miss the goal. Uh, most of the time, when we're failing to miss the mark, we don't really know it, right? We don't. We, we don't realize that's what's happening. Therefore, sin also can describe in the Bible the spin. Can, sin can describe the spin we put on our own choices, so when we call good bad and bad good, when we call evil good and we call good evil, putting our own spin on our choices, not knowing that we are not honoring God and missing the mark, missing the target. The Apostle Paul would describe sin in this way. In Romans 8, 6, he describes sin as a force or a power that is at work, not only within us, but overpowering us. In Romans 7, he said of himself and others, you know, because of this overpowering force in us called sin to miss the mark and to, and to miss the goal and not honor our creator God and, non, and honor others, because of this, I often am doing the things that I don't want to do and, doing, um, uh, what I, and not doing what I do want to do. Uh, to quote uh, Tim Mackey, author Tim Mackey, sin is a robust description of the human condition a failure to love God and to love others. It's our inability to judge whether we are succeeding or failing. And it is the deep, selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. Now, one of the first places in the Bible where sin is described, it's actually mentioned, the word is mentioned, and, and where this lack of honor for God, lack of honor for others, um, is in the story of two brothers named Cain and Abel. All right, in that story, Cain and Abel are both bringing an offering to God. And they both offer their offerings, and God accepts Abel's offering, but he does not accept Cain's offering. And he explains to Cain why. And, and Cain's response uh, is sin. Uh, eventually, he will actually murder his own brother. And, but before he does this, God is warning uh, Cain, and he describes it this way. He says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door like a ravenous wolf or a lion. 
that is ready to tear you apart and destroy you. This is what sin is like. It's just, it's just like a, it's just like, like, a, like a wild animal just crouching, ready to leap and destroy. In Cain, that's where, that's where sin is at with you right now. And be careful, be careful. Jesus would say something actually very similar to Peter. And we're getting closer to Peter now. He would say, Simon, Simon, that was Peter's birth name. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you. And he's talking to all of them, all the disciples. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. All right. Jesus is giving that same warning to Peter and the other disciples. What Satan wants to do is shake you so hard so as to just tear you apart. Not the imagery or the metaphor is not a ravenous wolf or lion, but it is the shifting of wheat so violent and so hard that it actually just tears you apart. And Jesus is bringing a warning to Peter. This is what is coming. So let's talk about Peter for a few minutes. Uh, and then we're going to, by the way, we're going to talk then, look in a little more, like I said, uh, just a deeper into what is going on when we are tempted and then our journey home. All right, so let's, let's again, take a little, uh, take a closer look at Peter. Peter and Jesus meet on the shore of Galilee. John chapter 1, verses 40 to 43, tell us that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John the Baptist had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, that is Peter. He brought Peter to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, at Peter, and said, You are Simon, and Simon is his given name, the son of John. And he was. He was John's son. You will be called Cephas, which means, uh, which means or is translated Peter or rock. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said, Follow me. So Jesus and Peter meet there on the shore of Galilee. Peter is a fisherman. He is in business with his brother Andrew. And Andrew and Peter are good friends with another fishing company, and they work closely together, run by the sons of Zebedee, James and John. Peter meets Jesus on the shore of Galilee, and Jesus looks deeply and intently into Peter the man and says, I'm giving you the name Rock. Now, uh, or, or translated Peter, uh, Rock is not a nickname. Rock is actually here. Uh, in fact, uh, what I found out was that Rock and, or Peter was not a name in the first century. That's, that's not like I'm, your name is Simon. I'm going to call you Andrew. That Andrew is a name. Or I'm going to call you Jacob. Jacob was a name. Or your name is Simon. I'm going to call you Moses. Those are all biblical. Those are all names in the first century. But Rock or Cephas was not. So it's not, it's, it's giving a name, but more than that, it's, it's just a prophetic word spoken by Jesus over Peter. Not long after this, and this is, you can read this in Luke chapter 5, uh, Peter the fisherman would be given a new vocation. They're there together, um, and they're, they're, they're fishing all night. Uh, once again, they're fishing, and, and they're just pulling in this large net of miraculous catch of fish. And they know that this is just not a good day. This is, this is a lot more than a good day. This is a lot more than an, uh, uh, an unusual large catch. Well, this, wait, wait, wait till we get home and tell everybody how many fish we caught today. Simon, Peter, Peter, and the rest all know that this is a result of the presence of Christ with them. And out of that moment, Peter falls before Jesus. He knows he has experienced some kind of a miracle with Jesus. And because of Jesus, Jesus invites Peter and the others to come and follow him. He's already asked them to follow him. Now he's asking them to take up a new vocation. You've been fishermen. Now what I want you to do is fish for men. Come and join me to bring the kingdom of God to the world. And Peter has a new vocational uh, assignment to come with Jesus and to bring the kingdom as a fisher of men. Sometime later in Matthew chapter 14, again on a boat, they were often on the Sea of Galilee, and they're on a boat, uh, and a storm comes across that sea, which is very common uh, in violent storms because of the way the sea, or really a large lake, 
sets uh, in, uh, with a mountain range surrounding it. So these winds would whip up through the mountains and come across that body of water. And now these are all professional fishermen and they grew up on the Galilee. So they, they know a bad storm when they see it and they know when they're in trouble. You know, we've lived here all of our lives. We know a dangerous situation and they are in one. They're really concerned and they're afraid they're going to sink. All right. And, and they're very, very afraid. Jesus, this night, is not with them. And he begins to walk toward them on the water. <clears throat> Simon Peter uh, calls out, recognizes that it's Jesus, and, and asks for Jesus to call to him. Simon wants to walk. Peter wants to walk on the water and walk toward, toward Jesus. Uh, and, and he did. Simon Peter uh, uh, got out of the boat. He said, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. And then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down and those who were with the boat worshiped him, uh, or in the boat, worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. At another time, uh, as their relationship would continue to grow, Peter is with Jesus along the other disciples, and Jesus asked all of his 12 followers, those, those 12 closest to him, he asked them, hey, you know, I know people are talking about me. I know the miracles and the things I'm saying and the teaching. Uh, people are talking, and they're saying different things about who I am. He said, what are you hearing? What are people saying about me? And, and they came up with a few things. Well, some people said, you're Elijah. Some people, you're John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. And then Jesus said, oh, now how about you guys? How about, how about you? What, who do you say that I am? Now, Peter says something here for the first time. And Jesus would acknowledge that, that Peter says this, again, prophetically. He can say this because God has given it to Peter to say. He said, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one from God, the one greater than Moses, the one God said he would send to bring salvation to the world. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And then Jesus responded by giving a blessing to Simon. He said, Simon, or, or Peter, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then we read a little farther uh, after Jesus talks about his going to Jerusalem and his suffering and his cross, Peter responds after just proclaiming that you are God, you are the Son of God, the Messiah. Peter, hearing that Jesus is talking about his own sacrificial death, Peter responds, no, absolutely no. Peter took him aside and said, and rebuked him and said, never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. And then you get the most, one of the more, most confrontational sentences you're going to see in all of the Bible. Jesus turned to, and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Is he calling Peter Satan, or does he recognize Satan unknowingly speaking through Peter to bring temptation uh, to Jesus? No, you don't have to go to the cross. And Jesus rebukes it immediately. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is Peter too. You know, in the Gospel of John, we, we see another time where Jesus is teaching on discipleship. Many, many people are following Jesus. They're following him because of the food, the bread, uh, the miracles. This is fantastic. This is amazing. Best show in all of Judea. You got to come and see this guy. He's doing these great miracles. Big, big crowds, right? Jesus has been teaching about discipleship, about following him. Not following him around so you can see great miracles, but following him in full surrender of your life. In fact, he says it this way. He said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of you, my blood, you would have no part in me. And if that sounds pretty radical and pretty, well, you know, like intense, uh, now, it sounded intense then, too. 
There's a real call, a kind of a drawing a line to say you've got to cross over into another level of commitment to me, Jesus would say. It was a very real, so real that the Bible says in John chapter 6, many people who'd been following him decided we're out of here. We're done. We're not, we're, we're not going there. We're not following Jesus in this way. We're not giving our lives. We're not, uh, we're not eating of his flesh or drinking of his blood. Whoa, no, no, no way. And, and Jesus, the Bible says, looks at Peter and the other disciples and says, how about you guys? Are, are you going to leave too? And Peter's response, actually, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? And in those words, you can, I think, see some despair and frustration. Hey, we've come this far from you, and we have paid a great price. Don't tell me you're not going to become the Messiah that we think you're going to become. I I just can't believe that. We're ready to go there. We're ready to eat the flesh and drink the blood, just as you said. But... But, but we have no place to go if we don't go with you. We're stuck here. And you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, not long after Peter makes that tremendous confession of the true identity of Jesus, he is on a mountain with James and John, those former partners in the fishing business, with Jesus, And they are there, and they see the Spirit of God. They see God descend in a cloud upon the the four of them, James and John and Peter and Jesus. And they see Jesus transfigured before them. They see Jesus, the man Jesus, changed before them. And not so much changed, because Jesus always had and carried and within him the glory of God, because he was God. They had just not seen it, not like today. I was reading, getting ready for today, that this author was saying that this was the first and last time anyone is going, has seen the glory of God in the person of Jesus. The next time we see this, he's going to be coming back. And what Peter and James and John saw on that day on the mountain, his radiant glory, the glory of God in the man Jesus, we will see on the day that he returns. He's taking Peter's earliest confession before he saw Jesus in all of his glory. He's saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And having it stunningly confirmed on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter has made his confession. He's faced his loyal despair. And now he experiences a vision of who Jesus really is. They're witnessing nothing less than the unveiled glory of God and the person of Jesus. Now you take all of that. You take, and there's more experiences, but those are some of the highlights of the experience that Jesus has, uh, Peter has had with Jesus. You know, some of the highs and some of the lows, and you come to uh, that last meal. They don't know it's the last meal, and you can read about this in John chapter 13 in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is the meal, this is the Passover meal before uh, Jesus is crucified, and they've come together to eat this meal, and there's confusion at the table. Maybe there's confusion because it is going to be their last meal together. Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to offer his life as a ransom for sin on the next day, but they don't know that. Kind of like being in one of those situations you know, where you sense something's going on here, but I, I don't know what it is. There's maybe someone in the room knows something. You find out later they knew that this was going to be the last meal. They knew that something, but... No one else knew, and you only know later. That's why maybe it seems so strange that night. There was confusion that night at the meal. Jesus came to Simon Peter and said, uh, uh, said to him, or he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Therefore, dinner that night, and Jesus has taken on the role of the servant so that he might wash the feet of his disciples. Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, only disciple to ever say no to Jesus. You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, not my hands, but my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, but their whole body is clean. You are clean, though not every one of you. And he's referring to, of course, Lazarus. And then he tells them what we read earlier. You, Simon, Simon, 
He's speaking to Simon by name, but he's talking to all of them. Satan has asked to sift all of you. Satan has asked to shake you so hard it could destroy you. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fall. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. You'll deny that you know me. As I said earlier, this is a story of temptation. The temptation that come to Peter, but it's also, and it is a story of his failing or falling to temptation. Here, Jesus has given a warning. Jesus has set Peter up. Peter, Satan is going to come to tempt you. It's going to be severe. It's going to be harsh. It's going to be overwhelming. You're going to feel concerned and worry and fear for your very life. I'm warning you so that you do not fail, so that you do not fall. In another place, Jesus would again warn Peter, I want you to watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And then he says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So many times, this is where we are when we face our own temptations. In our spirit and in our minds, we are convinced We're going to get through this. We're going to take this temptation on, and we're going to get through it. But the flesh that we rely on, our own strength, will not be enough. We must pray. Jesus had been praying for Peter, and now he's telling Peter, you must pray for yourself as well. And then, of course, there's the actual moment of the temptation and Peter's falling. Mark chapter 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, it's the same courtyard where they had taken Jesus on the night he was betrayed for his trial. There in that courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene. Another word for Jesus. But he denied it. Peter denied it. He said, I don't know. I don't understand what you're talking about. He said, I, and and he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him in the entryway, she said it again to those standing around now. Everybody, the small crowd gathered around the entryway. This guy, this fellow is one of them. And again, he denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely, come on, you you must be one of them, for you are a Galilean. How do they know that? Galileans had a very peculiar, particular accent, and they knew immediately. Peter tried to deny it. He did. He began to call down curses and swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. But his accent was betraying him. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. Breaking down a temptation. It's brutal. It's hard to see a man, uh, a person, deny Jesus and fall to temptation and to see it happen. It's hard to see it in our own lives. Well, what can we learn from Peter's temptation to prepare for our own? The story of Peter walking on water is a parable of faith and temptation, isn't it? We walk on water sometimes, but then we begin to see the waves, and we feel the wind, and we feel the resistance, and we feel the opposition. We're experiencing it, and the opposition is real. I'm not saying it's just that we're making it up in our head. The opposition is real. The threat and danger are real, and we get our eyes off of Jesus and onto the opposition and onto the threat, and we begin to sink. Most of all, and most of us know what it's like to get caught between the realities and temptations of life on the one side, against the, un, against the certainties of an unseen kingdom. I got my life over here. I got my boss. I got my employer that's threatening to lay me off. I've got a mortgage payment. I've got, you know, uh, behaviors. I've got addictions that I struggle with. And then over here, we've got these certainties of a kingdom we can't see. And we know the tension to live in between those. The key is to ask yourself, where am I looking? Where am I looking? And what am I looking at? And I'm not talking now about 
uh, you know, uh, pornography. That's something we always kind of go to right away, right, when we talk about temptation. But I'm not talking just about literally what we're looking at. I maybe, maybe it's even better to say, what are we looking at and what are we listening to? You know, Paul would say in Philippians 4, 8, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Where's your mind and where are your thoughts taking you? And what are your ears listening to? And what are your eyes looking at? The devil wants nothing more than to to control our gaze and to control our listening so that our heads and our hearts are filled with those things that are untruthful, that are not honoring of God, that are going to support the sin that he wants to tempt us with. The devil wants us to believe that we should be able to experience everything. Otherwise, we're going to be naive. Otherwise, we're going to be left out. We're going to end up looking stupid. It's always the same lie. What are you looking at? What are you listening to? The devil wants us to bring us into temptation. There are seeds of temptation that I want to talk about real quickly. Despair, disappointment, and disillusionment. In John 6, Jesus is taught on discipleship, and many decide to leave him. And it's, it's a despair that the disciples are seeing. There's a lot of people leaving. Wow, man, a lot of people are leaving. A lot of people don't agree with Jesus. A lot of people don't agree with us for following him. I don't know. This is pretty discouraging. You know, yesterday, this is, everything was going great. The numbers were awesome. And now a despair is settling in, and the despair becomes a seed for later and greater sin. Jesus, who has done great miracles and is clearly the Messiah, is going to suffer. This is a scandal. We feel stuck. We've left everything to be with you, Jesus. Where else can we go? We see Jesus, but our, but our despair over our disappointment and our circumstances of following him are starting to overwhelm us. And we are subject even more so to temptation and to deny him and walk away from him, not honor the God whose image we bear by not honoring others as well. Peter's been asked to submit to something. It's hard to accept this. We have a choice that we can make. We can leave like the others, or we can follow where it leads us, or or we can follow Jesus. Uh, We have a choice before us. The frustration, second seed, is disappointment. The frustration and confusion as Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, taking on the role of a a servant, brings about a, a level of disappointment. Oh, this is not what I expect. I'm disappointed. That night they were disappointed that Jesus, the greatest man, the most powerful man in the room, where's the victory? Where's the, where's the conquering hero? Where's the white stallion that, that, that you're going to ride to take us into military victory, into the city of Jerusalem? What, what, what are you doing? We're disappointed in Jesus and disappointed in God specifically. Peter has already been asked that night to submit to something he could not agree with. The Messiah is now washing other people's feet. I don't agree with this. God, I don't agree with what you're doing. And you're asking me to submit to it. I'm disappointed. And that disappointment, along with the disillusionment, and along with the despair, are sowing seeds to bring about Uh, a a tempting situation where Peter will fail. It sounds very, very familiar. Jesus has done many inappropriate things for the Messiah. He's healed people on the Sabbath. He's touched a dead person. He touched a leper. But this night may be the worst of them. He has taken on the role of a servant and has washed their feet. And their response is to be disappointed in God. The third seed is disillusionment. Peter had carried an expectation from the beginning, which shaped everything he knew about the Messiah. The Messiah will never submit, will never surrender, and never serve. And yet here on this night alone, Jesus has done all three. There's a heightened 
awareness as temptation is brought to Peter, just as temptation is brought to us, a heightened awareness and a heightened intensity. The young servant girl, first opportunity for Peter to acknowledge or to deny, faced with the temptation of denying Jesus, says, you also were there. And when she says also, what she means is that John, as we read from another place, John was there that night. So I, I already saw John tonight, and I know he's one of the disciples. You're one of the disciples too. It's guilt by association. It's his accent. We mentioned it already. He's from Galilee. He can't deny it. He can't say he's not from Galilee. He's already spoken. Everybody knows. You're from Galilee, and so was Jesus. You must be with him. He's already indicted himself. And then a relative of the man that Peter had tried to kill that night, his name was Malchus, in the garden when Peter took a sword out and charged the other uh, soldiers. A relative of that man recognizes him and begins to question his identity. Perhaps also Peter is remembering something that Jesus had already said earlier. If anyone denies me on earth, I will deny that person before my father and his angels. Michael Card speculates here, Peter's reply, I do not know the man, says a lot. Basically what Peter is saying is, I don't know this guy. He's not the Messiah I was looking for. Disappointed, disillusioned, and in despair. I was expecting uh, he would have done other things, great things. I did not expect him to do this, submit, surrender. And if he said, as he did, that he would rise on the third day, well, I don't know that I can trust this man and what he has to say. And in that moment where we see it, we see it right in the record for us to watch and learn a man named Peter falling to temptation right in front of us. We watch him do it so that we might learn and be prepared ourselves. There's a moment where it's of all very intentional. Jesus gazes at Peter. He's also in the courtyard the same night. And from across the courtyard, both of their eyes would meet. The word for gazing here is the same word that was used of Jesus when he gazed on Peter on that day when they met on the shore of Galilee. Now across the courtyard, Jesus gazes into the eyes of Peter. It's not a look of disappointment. Jesus isn't disappointed in Peter, I don't think. It's not not, not a look of resentment. You know, I hate you, man. You just just denied me. I know what you did. It's It's not, certainly not a look of condemnation, but most likely a look of love and one of forgiveness. That's who Jesus is. And that gaze... And that offer in the eyes of Jesus of forgiveness and love, even then, it breaks Peter. It breaks him, and he begins to weep. It broke him, which was probably the only way for Jesus to save him. After the fall, after the temptation, after the brokenness, a broken man is now able to see and receive the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Jesus is going to turn around and go to the cross, and he's going to cross. He's going to the cross for his friend. So do we leave Peter there? Is that what happens? Wow, wow, gosh, wow, that's a, boy, Pastor, that's a sad story. That's, 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 a, that's, that's hard to take, you know, just broken, the brokenness of it. And this broken man that night in the courtyard, betrayal and denial of Jesus, falling to temptation, just all of that. But as you know and may know, the story is also the story of Peter's journey back. At the resurrection, when they come to the tomb and find it empty, sometime on that day, uh, an angel says to some of the women followers of Jesus, hey, you know, go tell the disciples, and then Peter by name, and Peter, that he will meet them. Jesus will meet them. The angel is sure to follow what was probably specific instructions. Make sure you mention Peter's name. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you 
Peter runs to the tomb, hearing the news. He walks away and wonders, the tomb is empty. What has happened? The man Peter, the same man who would later, on hearing the voice of Jesus, also on the shore of Galilee, yet another time, the same man who would jump out of the boat. He can't wait to bring the boat into shore. He's got to jump out of the boat and swim 100 yards to get to the shore. To know Jesus is a man who knows the joy of having been forgiven. Forgiven. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, Peter would not have, had, would have lived the rest of his life knowing that he had denied and betrayed Jesus unforgiven. But this is not his story. Another morning, also by the shore of Galilee, these fishermen are fishing once again. There's another miraculous uh, time around with Jesus and um, present. And he's on the shore and he's preparing breakfast for them. And they begin to have a conversation, he and Peter. And he asked Peter three different times, do you love me? Do you love me? Peter would respond, Lord, you know I do. And ask him again, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. And it hurt Peter. But Jesus is intentionally restoring and bringing Peter back into a secure and confident relationship with him. What am I saying? You and I can experience and know the hope and the same promise of restoration that brings us out of our failed temptations and into that restored relationship with Jesus. He restores him. Those who suffer will never forget, will never forget Christ's stretch and Christ's offer of forgiveness in the midst of of our brokenness. Remember years ago, many, many years ago, I just gone through a very, very difficult time and, and, and I did not do very well. And I was talking to someone about what had happened and he talked to me about it and he was a mentor to me. And I was a very young guy. And he said to me, he said, he said, you feel pretty bad, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. He said, and, and it feels really crummy, doesn't it? It feels really bad to feel bad, doesn't it? I said, oh, yeah. He said, and you don't ever want to feel this way again. I said, no, I don't, I don't. I don't want to ever want to feel this way again. He said, then don't ever let this happen again. Don't ever let this happen again. Matthew tells us that they worshipped him. After they had seen many things and Peter had had fallen into the sea and he sank and here again he's sinking again after Peter walked on the water and stumbled now the Bible tells us for the first time they worshiped him the way that you and I know that we are back is how we have come back to worship him the way that you know you're back from temptation from falling to temptation although we don't have to fall is that we are back worshiping again Satan wants to sift Simon he wants to sift you and I like us, like that. With temptations, then he sifts and shakes us so hard that we feel like we're going to come apart, and then he tempts us to not honor our God and to not honor others who have been made in his image. And sometimes we fall for it, like a Simon Peter. Simon will be the one who stumbles, giving in to temptation, but Simon's faith will ultimately not fail, not fail because of the prayers of the intercessor, his intercessor, Jesus. Simon is going to repent. He's going to turn around. He's going to become a source of strength to his brothers. For, the, and for, the, for those two other uh, 11 guys, other uh, 10 guys, and a growing community uh, for all the followers of Jesus uh, during that era, and for every follower of Jesus since, Peter becomes for us a, a case study of temptation and recovering and the restoration that comes when we have failed and we have fallen. Simon will turn and strengthen his brothers. It's the prayers of Jesus that have made him strong. It's the witness of the Spirit for you and I that know that we have been forgiven and Christ is with us. And it's his prayers and our prayers, praying for ourselves, that bring us into the fullness of the relationship that has been threatened but not destroyed. As we trust in his grace and his love and forgiveness once again. 
Let's pray. Father, I do pray, especially we've been talking like this, and so I want to pray for anyone who's listening right now who, like a Peter, uh, have fallen into temptation. We were tempted uh, to not honor you, to make choices that would not be honoring to you. Uh, We were tempted to make some choices that uh, were not loving and not honoring to other people. We could have done any number of things, but the bottom line is we missed the mark. We missed the goal. We missed your desire and goal for us, which was to honor you and honor others, love you and love others by making these kinds of choices, and we didn't, and we didn't. We've carried our shame. We've carried our guilt. Father, we were disillusioned and disappointed, and we let it overcome us. But Father, we want to say before you, forgive us. As we look into your gaze, may we see the same, the same expression of love and forgiveness that Peter could see. And know that in our brokenness, we can and we are saved. Because you took the next steps to go to the cross so that we might be free from our guilt and shame and know the joy of forgiveness. So we pray for ourselves. Our spirit might be willing, but wow, so much of us is so weak, and we need your help, and we need your strength. We pray and give thanks that you're praying for us. We pray and ask for the witness of the Spirit of God who is in us, to let us know that all this is sure and certain in Jesus. Thank you. Tomorrow, tomorrow belongs to you, and it is a day of grace, and it is a day of mercy. Here we come. Here we come. Amen. 